Welcome, friends and foes, survivors and killers. Let's sit around the campfire together and talk about Dead by Daylight. Specifically, Vain Ambition. The story in Tome 10, Saw. Starring Amanda Young, otherwise known as The Pig. Ah, Amanda. I have a long and story relationship with who I would argue is the Saw franchise's most interesting character. For one, she's the reason I got into Dead by Daylight in the first place. I've loved Saw since I was 16, and despite knowing about the game for a while before then, the Saw DLC coming out was enough to get me to buy the and download the game for the first time. This channel and the new lease of life it's given me wouldn't have been possible without her arrival into the game. She's one of the first characters I ever talked about on this channel, long before I was monetized or YouTube became my job. Back then I was still learning a lot about how to make my videos and was doing so on a battered old gaming laptop that could only play DVD at about 20 frames a second. Something that really showed my video production. As a result, nothing makes me happier than having an excuse to go back and talk about Amanda again. With a bit more sophistication, more skills and better hardware to make this video the best it can be. To be as good as a character as interesting as Amanda deserves. And I got an excuse to do so from Tome 10 Saw. I'm gonna drop all pretenses of being coy. To me, this story was the main event of not just this tome, but of Dead by Daylight for this mid-chapter and it even overshadowed much a portrait of a murder with my sheer unquenchable hype for whatever it was we were going to get. And my reactions now that it's out are, um, deflated, shall we say. But before I go into why, I want to illustrate what made writing the tome so incredibly challenging. This is Behaviour's first licensed killer tome and the onus was on them to realise Amanda in the tome in a way that was faithful and loyal to how she appeared in the Saw movie she was a part of. This is no easy feat. Since Amanda is a central character in four different Saw movies that don't run concurrently or entirely in chronological order. And for the benefit of you few unlucky people who haven't marathoned Saw movies to 22 hours to prepare for this video, I'm going to give a breakdown of how Amanda's story plays out chronologically. The first we know of Amanda Young is mentioned in Saw 2. She was a regular person who was sent to prison by Detective Eric Matthews after he framed her for drug possession. When she was inside, her cellmate Donnie Greco started selling her the same drugs she was framed for possessing, ensuring she left prison an addict. It's something that we never see on screen, but it's very significant because it marks the start of both Amanda's disdain for others and the addiction that would bring her to Jigsaw's attention. That addiction leads her to the Homeward Bound Recovery Clinic, run by Jill Kramer and helped by her husband, civil engineer John Kramer. This is long before John's cancer diagnosis and his rebirth as Jigsaw. She was in a relationship with another attendee of the clinic at the time, fellow addict Cecil Adams. But unlike Cecil, Amanda had effectively been cut off by the clinic. Jill had given up on trying to help her, and despite Cecil's protests, Amanda coerced him into raiding the clinic for drugs. In doing so, Cecil accidentally smashed a door into Jill's pregnant belly, causing a miscarriage and resulting in John and Jill losing their son Gideon. This marks the beginning of the end for John and Jill's marriage and John's first trap as he constructs the knife chair for Cecil, which ultimately kills him. Without Cecil, Amanda wastes away as an addict until the fresh run of Jigsaw games begin, when she awakes in a darkened room with a TV in front of her and a strange device we would come to know as the reverse bear trap, fitted to her upper and lower jaws. In what is inarguably Saw's most iconic scene, the rules of Amanda's game is explained to her by a macabre puppet that addresses her from the TV screen. Once she triggered the timer by getting out of the chair, she would have only a short time to retrieve the key to the device, for it ripped her mouth open. The key was in the stomach of Donnie Greco, her cellmate turned dealer. The TV said he was dead, but as Amanda would soon discover, that wasn't quite true. After cutting his stomach open, Amanda finds the key and removes the trap with just a few seconds to go before it goes off. And a fun fact, apparently the reverse bear trap prop actually works in real life. Like, they had to demonstrate its effectiveness on the mannequin head and the tape, and couldn't afford to build multiple traps, so Shawnee Smith just had to wear a device that could tear her jaws open if it was actually activated. The scene as a whole is just relentlessly impressive. Shawnee was on set for just one day of the 18 days of filming for Saw, but she had the flu on the day she was in, so her entire performance as Amanda in that first movie was while she was sick. 
and to still put in a committed performance that captured so many people's imaginations and made Amanda a fan favourite character is to be applauded. In any case, Amanda's escape from the reverse bear trap marks the first canonical survivor of a jigsaw trap and the ultimate proof in the pudding for John's philosophy of self-recovery through trauma. He would go on to introduce Amanda to Jill at the clinic as his proof of concept to her. Jill had written off Amanda as a lost cause, but thanks to John's unorthodox treatment, Amanda seemed to have been instantly rehabilitated. Amanda would become Jigsaw's most devoted follower and would co-conspire with him to mastermind the games going forwards. That shouldn't be surprising. John had saved her from herself and given her a new lease of life, after he'd been responsible for the death of his unborn child. In her mind at least, she owed him an incalculably large debt. So when he asked her to join him, dedicate her life to his work and maybe inherit the jigsaw mantle upon John's passing, she accepted with an earnest sincerity. The relationship between John and Amanda as documented in Saw 3 is probably Saw's most complex relationship, and I'll be breaking it down fully when I continue my Saw analysis series with my video on Saw 3 in the near future. But for now, what matters is Amanda being touted as a successor to John's legacy upon his eventual death. Which, let's be real, is more of a when than an if due to his terminal cancer. Alongside Mark Hoffman, the detective strong-armed by John into being the muscle behind the games, Amanda would form the core of John's support network as the games expanded in scope and John's physical health began to deteriorate. She was behind the capture of Adam Stanhype for his role in the bathroom game and was a key part of the nerve gas house in the second movie. Pretending to be a helpless victim of Jigsaw and the final girl of the movie, before the revelation at the end that she was working for Jigsaw the whole time. This was the first game where Amanda provided more than just a helping hand, and it went pretty much perfectly. Eric Matthews, the corrupt cop who framed Amanda and dozens more innocent victims, wound up locked in the bathroom to rot, and John and Amanda escaped the authorities. But between his cancer taking even more of a toll, and Eric's brutal beatdown at the Wilson Steel Factory, John's condition rapidly became critical. John's sickness and the success of the Wilson Steel game meant Amanda started to have more and more input over the games going forward. Which is where this story comes in. It's set between the events of Saw 2 and 3, while John's condition is getting worse, and Amanda is learning how to construct her own games so that when he does die, she's able to easily pick up where he left off. And before I rip too hard into this story, I want to start by saying the events of the story make sense on paper. If you were to line up what happens in Vain Ambition on a little timeline and hold it up next to the Saw timeline, it fits together. It isn't like the Tap story, where it doesn't make sense at first glance and requires a little bit of legwork of the brain to get it all in order. If we're talking in terms purely of preserving the integrity of the extremely messy Saw timeline, Vain Ambition holds water. There is, admittedly, a six month time gap between the events of Saw 2 and 3 where we know very little about John's activities. We know he's planning the events of Saw 3 and 4, something we'll get a little glance into during a flashback in Saw 6, but beyond that it's pretty sparse. Vain Ambition was a golden opportunity to fill in the cracks created by the time skip, and to observe how Amanda goes from a loyal follower of John and his teachings at the end of Saw 2, to the wayward emotional apprentice that she is in Saw 3. This is an area that the upcoming Saw 10 might be exploring in the nearish future, but for now, Vain Ambition is the best coverage we have of this murky but important part of the Saw timeline. Sadly, that's the highest praise I can give to this story, because despite covering an extremely important part of the story for both Amanda and John, it doesn't really do either of these characters justice, especially Amanda. But before I get onto that, I want to delve into something I've had to address many times in talking about the Tome stories just how amateurish the actual fundamental pieces of writing can be. The language use is just bad, plain and simple. Like, look at this. Does this look like it was written by a professional writer whose first language was English? How could he doubt her? His teachings are law. But if his teachings are law, surely she realised the issue was with herself and not with John doubting her, right? It makes absolutely no sense. She goes from questioning John's doubts of her methods to affirming that he's infallible. Then there's things like, his inhale turns into a coughing fit. And 
I'm sorry, but his inhale just doesn't read well. It's not technically incorrect, but it just reads such an ugly way that could easily have been edited. As he breathes in, his lungs seize into a coughing fit, for example. Like, there's so much that could be done to make this passage so much smoother to read, but it's like it never even saw an editor. And that's pretty typical of the entire story, to be honest. And not just this story, mind you, but it's typical of a lot of behaviour's offerings across many of the tomes. Bill's tome story, the nurse's tome story, the hag's tome story. All of these had similar problems with the writing structure on a fundamental language level. What I'm about to say here is purely conjecture, but the wild inconsistent quality of the tome stories has left me to conclude that behaviour has exactly two writers who make the character stories for the tomes. One of them has a deep and complex understanding of the character at hand and gets it across with wonderful prose and a compelling story that allows the character to shine. The other has a bare bones understanding of their character and themes and their writing is sloppy, often poorly conceived and internally inconsistent with the character's pre-existing themes and canon. I fear the latter writer has got their grubby hands on Amanda's story, but what I fear more is the lack of an editor's pen, because for this many rookie errors to slip through, there's got to be something missing in the process between writing and publication. Are these stories just not edited properly? Are they edited by somebody whose first language isn't English? Is there even an editor at all? If none of these things are true, you might want to get a better editor because I shouldn't even have to ask these questions. The language difficulties also mean that Amanda's internal monologue really isn't authentic to the voice of the character which would be a lot more tolerable if we had some conversation to work with between her and John. Amanda isn't the kind of character who naturally suits a verbose and philosophical internal monologue. Most of the time she speaks in fairly short sentences, curses a lot and doesn't really talk more than she has to, unless she's trying to make a point. Like when she confronts Lynn with the axe in Saw 3. Even in her tapes, such as the ones she leaves for Eric Matthews, she doesn't exactly mince her words. Amanda is a practical thinker, and that's reflected in her speech, which makes her internal monologue here pretty unconvincing. There's a lot that could be done with the language to make Amanda's internal monologue sound more, well, like Amanda. You can see early on a great example is saying she broke into Grace's inbox to find her flaw. Find her flaw is some pretty emotionally heavy language for someone so detached from her victims as Amanda. Perhaps if this phrase was something like, dig up some dirt, it would fit better. It's more disparaging while getting across that same message of the pure saviour of the city being just as bad as the rest of us. You know who does talk like this though, with lots of verbose language and philosophy behind every word? John. Even in unscripted conversation, John scatters his speech with metaphors and language evocative of a judge, philosopher or religious leader. Of these two people, who's more likely to say, our time together is limited? Maybe we'd be able to get that contrast between Amanda's utilitarianism and John's verbosity if we actually heard John say anything in this story. But we don't. We just get rough allusions to what he said. Like the writer is scared to try to give a character an authentic voice because they know they'll mess it up. John isn't even a character in this story. He's just an emotionless feedback machine that tells Amanda she's not good enough and which she almost completely ignores. As a rampant John Kramer enthusiast, I find it to be an absolutely shocking waste of a great character, especially since John's such a huge part of Amanda's life and is one of horror's most iconic characters who defines not just Saw, but an entire subgenre of horror that it inspired. It's like if they were doing the flavour text of Michael Myers' perks in Dead by Daylight, but instead of using Dr. Lewis's description of Michael, it just told us the random bits of information about him. like. He's wearing a blue boiler suit, or he likes to stab people. It's such a massive waste of an iconic and distinctive character. Like, you were given carte blanche to do whatever you wanted, had John fucking Kramer to work with, and you gave him nothing to say and not a lot to do when interacting with his favourite apprentice. Thank you, writer. Very cool. But as I've said before, I'll forgive some uh, rough syntax or language use if the story it tells works anyway. 
unless it's so bad it distracts from the story, some level of imperfect syntax is inevitable and ultimately forgivable, when the story is interesting enough to grip you anyway. And sadly, vain ambition is not interesting enough because of the actually big problem that anyone familiar with Saw will be able to notice. Amanda in this story is, um, way too fucked up. Like, she's not exactly an outstanding member of the community running a Sunday school and building hospitals in the existing Saw canon, but this story represents a gross misunderstanding of who she is, her relationship with John, and the circumstances that led to her becoming his apprentice. To put it simply, Amanda's problem in this story centres around her ego. In this story, a huge amount of emphasis is placed on Amanda's ego and how she sees herself as the perfect inheritor of John's legacy. Look at the passage I quoted earlier, for example. How could he doubt her? That's not the words of somebody who's willing to take criticism or doubts themselves in any way. And this confidence is reinforced constantly throughout the story. His legacy is in good hands. John will be able to rest once he's convinced his life's work is in capable hands the rightful and only successor of John Kramer. This isn't the story of someone who wants to learn from John, it's the story of someone who thinks she's already perfectly suited to inheriting his mantle. And Amanda is not that person. From the moment she signs on as his apprentice and to the moment of her death on the floor of the Gideon meatpacking plant, Amanda is never confident in her own abilities or methods, ever. Look at this scene from Saw 3 depicting John and Amanda setting up the bathroom game that we see in the original movie. Does this look like someone who's confident in her own abilities to handle or prepare a game? John is calm and methodical in his application, but Amanda is clearly anxious, covered in sweat and tears, and doesn't even have the confidence to meet John's gaze as she attaches the shackle to Adam's leg and dumps him in the tub. The entire scene has a vibe of Amanda being on the verge of a panic attack as the weight of what she's done bogs her down like the body she's carrying on the platform. And the writers of the story somehow misconstrued this as adrenaline? Like, excitement? Is this the face of someone excited at the idea of what's about to transpire? I'll come back to this later, but erasing Amanda's uncertainties and worries about what she's getting herself into vandalizes her character in several different ways. In the movie, she doesn't fully believe in what she's doing a belief that manifests in the tumultuous ending of Saw 3, but she believes unfalteringly in John, and that's reason enough to keep doing it. Seriously, the writer who made this story needs to watch Saw 3. Because the way this reads, it's like if Amanda's speech to Eric at the end of Saw 2 was her entire personality, and Amanda is so much more than that. She's a brutal torturer who fanatically follows John, yes, but she's also a deeply vulnerable person who's struggling to reconcile her ideological differences with her mentor with her devotion to him. And that vulnerability, causing a rift to grow between her and John, forms the emotional core of Saw 3. This recharacterization of Amanda as a one-dimensional psychopath instead of a tortured woman struggling to live up to her mentor's expectations causes a number of problems. First, it makes Amanda seem way more willfully evil than she is in the movies with a lot more selfish or outright evil moments. Take the cage rat trap at the start. First of all, animal abuse has never been used as an element in any Saw movie. The closest we've ever come to that is the pig vat in Saw 3, but that was using long dead pigs, not live animals as a method of inflicting pain. The trap idea is incredibly grotesque and comes from medieval torture method where trap rats were used to scratch through a prisoner but it seems really out of place in the Saw movies. Saw has long been defined by its horrifying contraptions and difficult choices made by the victims, but this trap doesn't have a contraption or a choice. It's just someone dying horribly and Amanda watching. And you could argue, yeah, it's Amanda's early attempt at a game of her own. Of course there's going to be something wrong with it. But even with that being true, Amanda's reaction to it is still super uncharacteristic for her. And because John isn't given a proper voice in the story, it doesn't do a good job assuring us this is the sort of trap that Amanda shouldn't be designing. The trap lacks Saul's typical theatricality in favour of pure gruesomeness, and that combined with Amanda's exhilaration at watching her victim die paints a super unflattering and unfaithful image of Jigsaw's favoured disciple. The closest she ever comes to that is when she watches Alison Carey die in the angel trap without really any expression at all. 
She doesn't seem to feel remorse, but she's also not cackling maniacally like a Saturday morning cartoon villain as Carrie dies. Don't get me wrong, she'd have no reason to pity Carrie necessarily. After all, she was a cop just like Eric, who was in a relationship with him and represents the corrupt police institution that Amanda was a victim of. But at the same time, we can't erase Amanda's more human moments when it comes to her victims, like how she breaks down in tears while watching Timothy Young die in the wreck. She was still responsible for his death, but she clearly didn't take some kind of sadistic pleasure in watching it. Amanda in Vain Ambition is much more evil and heartless than Amanda in Saw, and that's a problem when the only character capable of challenging that narrative or providing a foil to her in the story isn't even given a real voice. She learns nothing because she's too conceited to listen to her mentor, and that's a massive betrayal of everything Amanda is. The obsession this story has with Amanda's ego that it fabricated not only makes her look more evil than she is, but also showcases a fundamental misunderstanding of her whole arc throughout Saw, and especially her time as a Jigsaw apprentice. At the end of the day, yes, Amanda is more brutal than John because her traps are not escapable. But they're not inescapable because Amanda gets some sadistic joy out of it, or watching her victim struggle, or because it affirms some superiority complex. Amanda's traps are inescapable because she fundamentally does not believe John's methods change people for the better the way he thinks they do. Saw 3 is basically a giant deconstruction of the idea that John's methods genuinely help people, and Amanda is aware of that. Remember, she was the proof of John's methods working as his first survivor who seemed to have reformed her drug addiction after her time in the reverse bear trap. But seemed is really the operative term here. Because while Amanda doesn't relapse into drug addiction, she just moves on to a different self destructive coping mechanism, self-harm. While John's methods may have put a stop to her drug addiction, his mission statement of making his victims cherish their lives doesn't seem to have worked for Amanda. Hell, John's even tested people who've self-harmed before. Amanda, I think, is painfully aware of this, and it drives her philosophy towards the Jigsaw games she oversees. John could not fix her. His proof of concept ultimately proved nothing. Amanda's philosophy differs from John's because she believes people cannot be saved. That's why so many of her traps are inescapable death traps. What's the point of letting anyone go if doing so isn't going to change anything? If they're going to wind up feeling just as miserable and pointless as she does? Amanda firmly believes that she is unfixable and that John's faith in her is misplaced. And that's so unbelievably tragic. John shouldered so much responsibility to fix her and set her on the right path, and Amanda wants that, but doesn't know how. That's what her breakdown at the end of Saw 3 is. She sees herself and John as murderers, and everything the two of them have done as a waste of time, and John has no way to convince her otherwise. That's not someone who egotistically believes themselves to be John Kramer's rightful successor, this is someone who cannot deal with the prospect of being left on her own, because she believes there's something fundamentally broken about her, and being around John used to give her some hope that she could get better. It's the opposite of ego. It's a fatalistic inability to believe in one's own ability to heal. Vain ambition totally fails to understand that principle. The idea that Amanda could be so much better, but puts her faith so completely in John's ability to heal her, that she doesn't realise it's time for her to heal herself. And the most bittersweet part is that in all of her self-doubt, Amanda was wrong. She could have been better, she could have healed herself, and John tried so hard to help her do it. Towards the end of Saw 3, John instructs Amanda to go and open a drawer that contains a letter, but the letter waiting for her wasn't written by John. We end up learning in Saw 6 that this letter was a blackmail letter from Mark Hoffman, John's other apprentice at the time, who threatened to expose Amanda's involvement in Jill's miscarriage if she didn't kill Lynn Denlin, the doctor treating John. It causes Amanda to break down in tears and ultimately drives her to shoot Lynn, unknowingly sealing the fate of both her and her mentor. This revelation, often overskipped quite late in the Saw franchise, recontextualizes everything about Amanda's actions and motive rant at the end of Saw 3. Suddenly, Amanda didn't lash out and shoot Lynn because it was in her nature, because she's unfixable, but because she was manipulated by Hoffman into doing so. John wasn't the one who wrote the letter that drove Amanda to desperation, but he didn't know that. 
It makes both their deaths so, so tragic because they died believing it was Amanda's fault, validating all her doubts about herself when they were never right in the first place. John dies believing Amanda let him down, and Amanda dies believing she could never have passed John's test because she was incapable of living without him. I'll be going more into this plot twist in my video on Saw 3, but suffice to say the theme of Amanda's ego invade ambition could not be more out of place for a character who believes so completely that she's fundamentally broken. Vain ambition hurts to read and hurts more to talk about, because Amanda Young is a character very near and dear to my heart. Her and John's relationship is the emotional core of the Saw franchise. This story presented an incredibly valuable opportunity to enrich that relationship, and it just didn't. Amanda is a very complex character who needs to be treated with respect and faithfulness to her themes to come across appropriately, and Vain Ambition doesn't even come close. Maybe if they were testing Hoffman, a much more traditional villain with more blatant psychopathic tendencies and no complex relationships to balance with the narrative, this would have been a satisfying enough story. But trying to reframe Amanda as a psychopathic sadist who tortures for her own gratification and sense of control is a betrayal. Plain and simple. Yep, yeah, I heard everyone saying, oh, we want a more psychopathic and more openly evil female villain. This is not how you do it. If this was any other character, if it was Freddy or Michael or Nemesis or one of the original characters, I'd be disappointed and maybe a little bitter at the opportunities missed in the tone. But for a character I value as much as Amanda, I just feel defeated, frankly. And I don't really want to talk about it anymore because, well, what's the point? The writer clearly didn't care enough about Amanda to understand her, to see her as the deeply flawed and gorgeously complex character she is, and to translate the unique and intimate relationship she has with her mentor and father figure into a well-written story. Why should I care enough to give them credit for it? I'll be talking about Amanda's character more completely in the Saw 3 review coming up on the channel, but frankly, I'm all sorted out for the moment. I put a lot of stock in this tone being good. It's the franchise that got me into this game. It's one of my favorite franchises in all of cinema, and being able to talk about it again felt like going home. But now I'm here talking about it, and all I can think is, this is not Amanda. This is not Saw. It looks like it, but it's wrong. This is deeply, painfully wrong. And if what I've said so far hasn't convinced you, then I don't know what else I can say. All I can say as a closing statement is, I expected so much better. Okay, so that's everything I have to say about this tome story, and <sighs> it feels good to get it off my shoulders. I hope this video has been of some help to you, and if it was, then please do consider liking the video, subscribe if you're not already, and ring the notification bell to never miss another upload. I will be talking more about Amanda in my Saw 3 analysis in the not too distant future, but I'll be doing other things for now. I have several original characters that I'd really like to touch on. I've been playing through the Evil Within series and been absolutely enraptured by it, so do expect a potential problems video about that in the not too distant future as well. And when the artist gets a balance update, likely in the Sadako mid chapter, I'll be making a full guide on her because I've frankly been absolutely loving it. In the description, you can find links to my Twitch, my Twitter, my Discord server, and my Kofi and Patreon links if you feel like this content deserves your money. And you can also find links to my brand new merch store featuring two gorgeous merch designs that you can pick up on a t shirt or a hoodie. That's all from me and I'll see you in the next one. Ta-ta for now.